There's quite a lot of people here. That's good. That's good. Uh, welcome. Hello and welcome to In Conversation uh, with someone I have wanted to meet for quite a long time. Lem, good, uh, good to see you. Good he's to a, see you. He's a writer, a poet, the official poet of the 2012 London Olympics. I've got to, can I just say something about that? Is that yeah. okay? I, I was one of, one of about six poets. Ah. And um, I was the first poet commissioned to write uh, a poem on the, for the Olympics. I was shown around the site before it was, before it was built, so when it was all mud. Um, and I was shown a matchmaking factory that was on the edge of the, of the Olympic site. And it's where the, the match girls went on strike in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And then I dug further into the, uh, into the um, research and I found a line by Annie Besant, who was speaking on behalf of these women who were striking. And she said, if only there were, a, in the 1800s, she said, if only there were a poet who could write of this, these, these, their plight. And that was a calling for me to write the poem, uh, Strike, which is on the, which was the, which was, which was placed on the side of a structure in the Olympic Park, and which is there to, to this day. So that, that was a hundred, more than a hundred years ago, spoke to you That's in 2012. Right. That's or right. Or 20, well, earlier than that, because you, it, when they were building the site. That's yeah. quite amazing, isn't it? Shows how important it is to write and to, to articulate uh, the struggle, which is what Annie Besant was, was doing. My poem, a hundred years later, has done her no good. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's done yeah, her yeah. no good. So, but it was a calling for me, to, for me as a poet to do that. And that article is in a magazine called uh, White Slavery in London. Uh, and you can Google it. Uh, White Slavery in London uh, by Annie Besant in the 1800s. And she preceded the suffragettes. So she was just, it just happened before the suffragette movement as well. She was part of that sort of, those middle class women who were supporting those working class women's struggle, which was a lot of the suffragettes well, was about that. What's, well, there's lots of things amazing about that story, but one of the things that's amazing about it is that you found out about it. You know, that this is a hidden, oh, there's a see. whole hidden history hidden of history women in menial jobs who oh. for centuries were taken for granted. Who were the people when I was in the children's homes who saw everything? The domestics. Uh, you yeah. see, it was the cleaners who saw everything and they, they used to communicate with us in care. Um, they used to communicate with us in a way that the social workers didn't and the things didn't. But God, I was going to say something about the, 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 the women, uh, the, the Annie Besant, the Match Girls. And that, if you go to the TUC building in, in central London, there's a plaque about the Match Girls being the first strike action in the history of trade unions. Is that right? It's absolutely 100% yeah. right. Well, These stories which are uh, missing are waiting there to be discovered. I, we're, we're writing here, right? we're writing, we've gone writing, but I need to tell you this. <laughs> I went, I was up for a BAFTA. <laughs> BAFTA! <laughs> BAFTA boy! So I was up for a BAFTA and I always tell the bus drivers that. And, uh, and the person who won it when I was there was, there was Grayson Perry, me, and Lucy Worsley. And Lucy Worsley won that year for a programme which was about suffragettes by a production company that was all women. Right. Okay? And when, yeah. <laughs> and and, when, and when, when she went up, and I blogged about this, so you'll see this. But when she went up, when they went up and they won and they got it, and I, you know, I really wanted that BAFTA. Do you know what I mean? I, I will kid you not. I wanted it. But when she went up and got it, it all made sense because they would not have been there only 10 years ago. Right. Only 10 years ago, you wouldn't have had a, uh, an all women production team. You wouldn't have had them at that level, and they wouldn't have been making a documentary, which is what they made about Sylvia Pankhurst um, uh, 
uh, entirely about Sylvia Pankhurst, using, um, using um, w w women presently dressed, the way they made the programme was innovative, basically. Mm -hmm. But they wouldn't have been there before. Yeah. It was, you know, we may not want to admit to it, but it was jobs for the boys, even if the boys felt enlightened themselves. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. so, so as soon as we were talking about this backstage, it's not about lowering the bar when you're inclusive and diversity. It's widening the range. And when those women went up for that award, it made total sense to me. Then uh, now is not a good time for me to tell you that I'm on the BAFTA jury. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought I'd get that out there. Uh, anyway, moving swiftly on. Um, <laughs> but it is fascinating that when you dig in the research, you know, if you trust that, that the poem is there, regardless of, by the way, of whether it's about women or whatever, if you trust that it's there, you, you know, you keep digging and you, you'll find a vein of gold somehow. But I, I want to get onto other things in a minute, but I'm really interested in the creative spark. Yes. That's what we were talking about spark. back there. So, we, I mean, that was a spark. Let me just tell you this. <laughs> Let me just tell you this. This one thing, this one thing, if you Google this now, you'll see. The poem is called Spark Catchers. Ah, well, there we are. And it's about women in a factory who practice under the full moon catching sparks because if there's one spark in the factory it will it will blow up they're, they're so they do this so the women they, they do this thing where they at night they practice that and i talk about the the back bending and the, the, there's something otherworldly about this circle of women catching sparks under the moonlight to practice in case it happens in the factory and then the line strike comes into the poem um yeah, it's great lost, to be able to talk about. Uh, but that, it's that, just wonderful to. I mean, did you know when you were a kid? We'll talk about other things about your childhood in a minute. But, yeah. But did you know when you were a kid that you would write? Did you? Did you? Did you have an alternative? Well, two things is uh, you've just come back from Shetland. Yeah. In Shetland, I went to the Shetland Literature Festival uh, some some years ago, and I met a guy called uh, David Knopfler. David Knopfler is the brother of, of Mark, Mark Knopfler. Knopfler. <laughs> and he did the first album that Dire Straits yeah. did. Mark Knopfler is in Dire Straits. David Knopfler fell out with Mark and they don't talk, they don't meet. Um, but he does, and it's well documented. And he does, and David goes out playing on his guitar in venues like this, you know, around the country and in Germany, et cetera, et cetera. He said to me, that, and we became friends. I'm not an easy person to be friends with, but we became friends. With. And he said, um, he said, he said, um, he said, he said, what's your plan B? And I, 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 something like that. No, he said to me, you didn't have a plan B, did you? I said, uh -huh. no, I didn't. Yeah. There was no plan B. And so my answer to you is that I always knew that I wanted to be a poet from the age of 12, which is the time I went into children's homes from the foster parents. I always knew I wanted to be a poet and that's how I understood the world. Um, yeah, and, and it was very clear to me. And I've, I've made television documentaries since then where I've gone back. The last one was with Alan Yentob. He mm. made the documentary. And I went back to my schools and there you find a teacher who'll say, yeah, from the age of 12, you were writing poetry. But, but was there a plan A? I mean, no, 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 no. Yeah, there was no that's there was, what I mean. There, no, there, no, there, was, there was no, no plan, no, 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 but you just all, did no, it. All I knew is I wanted to write uh, I, I wanted to write, and I think that everybody, uh, I mean, I think one of the, what is a great thing is, is, is that you can be a doctor and a writer, you can be a teacher and a writer, you can be a lawyer and a writer, and in mm -hmm. fact, sometimes it's better, you can be a journalist and a writer. You can be a bank clerk and a writer, not you, bank clerk, no, but T.S. Eliot uh, worked yes, in a bank, essentially. Yes, and it? actually you can draw, you can draw from all of that, um, that, that, that source material mm -hmm. and bring that into your work. I mean, you, so you can be a scientist. Though. That's, the, no, that's the key I, thing. No, you? I didn't have an alternative. I didn't have an alternative. I didn't have an alternative. But, you know, there can be, you can be, I really believe this, you can be, um, if you find what your talent is, it doesn't mean to say that you have to make a career out of it, but I think it's just as creative if you found that fixing cars, 
Something happens. Everybody wants our child, their child ultimately possibly to find what it is that makes them go, oh. Mm -hmm. You know, you take your kids to, 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 to football or to basketball or to swimming, you know, sit in the car like, <laughs> <laughs> and then they go, you bought them all the material, you know. You've got the tickets, you, you know. You, yeah. Then they come back and you're like, please let this be the one. And then, I, and then they're like, I don't want to play violin anymore. <laughs> I don't like it. You forced it on me. <laughs> like, no, I didn't. But, but then they're on to the next thing. You want them to find that thing where you can look at them and you think, oh, something happened. Oh, she's talking about mathematics in a way which is alien to me but it's beautiful when i watch right. you know so you want so you and you, yeah and you see them having that with other things i found my thing mm -hmm. so i am on one level i am the luckiest person on earth because i found my thing and like you know you know if your child lights onto something how much you, you must see them. I don't have children, but you must see them and think, oh, please, you know, that light that I see mm -hmm. in you when you're playing football, don't let it, oh, she's gone. She doesn't want to play anymore. Okay, <laughs> that light when you're violin, oh, no, she's gone. You know, it, it, it's, yeah. it, it, it's that that I found. But what, when you, because you first self-published, didn't you, as a teenager? I did, like most so, poets, most, so, most, yeah. most so like what, most um, self-respected what, poets. What, yeah. what's, what's, that, what's that like? You've got, you've got, you've got the ideas, you write, you do that, that's lonely, and then suddenly somebody else is going to look at it. <laughs> well, that's, that's, you know, this is really funny because I'm, I've been commissioned to write a play for Frantic Assembly, who are an incredible world-class theatre company, and they've asked me to, to translate, uh, to adapt um, uh, Metamorphosis by Franz Kafka. Really? Yeah. Right. And <laughs> yesterday I called, uh, should I be talking about this? <laughs> I'm going to say it anyway, but I called Frantic after writing for a while, like said, I cannot do this. I cannot do it. I have not got the skill. I am not the person who can do this. You need somebody else. There's another writer who's cleverer than me, who can, who's clever. Well, who's different, who can, actually. Isn't well, it? you know, who's, I mean, who's time served, who's, 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 uh, who's, who's, um, I can't do this. Um, I cannot do it. And um, I have written some things, but I couldn't see, I couldn't see, um, I couldn't see that I could do it. That I couldn't see anything in what I'd written. Anyway. So I sent it to, the, to him after telling, you know, after having this conversation about not being able to do it. Actually, after saying, I'm, I can't do the project. You know, like, I'm out. Mm -hmm. you know, this is money that I, you know, I'm not going to be paid. This is, you know, et cetera. And, um, and it, anyway, I, I took a look at what I'd written after that conversation. And uh, after the conversation saying, look, I'll, I'll, I'll take a look at what I've written. Because I had to face the person and say to the person face to face on, that's not easy to do. And, uh, and, I, and actually, I wrote more, and I redrafted what I'd written. Just 15 minutes. I found it. I found it. And, uh, and then I sent it. And today, he wrote back and said, we've got something here. You know, we can continue this conversation, mm -hmm. so we're going to continue the conversation. The reason that I said that to you is that, um, is that I fluctuate I'm sorry, but I, between, it's quite actually pathetic and maybe quite indulgent uh, between thinking, you know, I, I can do this. I don't think I'm good ever, but I think I can do this. Mm -hmm. I've got, I've, I can do this. I can do this uh, to, I, I'm just, I'm just no good. I'm actually, actually no, I'm actually no, I'm, I've actually spent quite a long time uh, tricking people with <laughs> with jokes, uh, with with personality, whatever that means, which I don't believe that actually on one level I just don't believe that at all. But anyway, this is all quite self indulgent, and I think that's that's that. But the, but it's real. Um, Do you know what though? It, it, there's a lot of people who uh, want to write and then think it's rubbish. 
Yeah. And it may or may not be true, but the one thing that is necessary is persistence. I was once told that yeah. they, uh, by somebody that uh, writing is all about, uh, quite a famous author, writing is all about application, mainly the application of the seat of your pants to the seat of the chair, mm -hmm. and you get on with it. Actually, yeah, he said so it true. more rudely. I'm not yeah. going to say exactly <laughs> what. Yeah. Uh, but it's, uh, it get something, do it, yeah. is what he said. Uh, uh, so, yeah, are you going to do it? Wonderful thing. I, yeah, I will. Yeah, I mean, you mean, you, you, we're going to talk about reading, but I just, wanted to, I just wanted to say that a couple of days ago, I was with probably a colleague of yours or somebody who you'll know, John Snow. I was with John Snow, mm, yeah. and and uh, we we, um, we can you hear the clanging of the names dropping? Can you? <laughs> God. But anyway, I, it was a couple of days ago, and it was John Snow, and it was at Grenf It was at a school um, to launch the uh, well-being and education facility uh, in the shadow of Grenfell under the name of a young Eth Ethiopian boy who'd, who'd uh, died in Grenfell and all of his family's, family's family was there. And I got to read a poem, uh, which for the family and the audience was there. We were outside and it was kind of beautiful. There, there was a uh, silver birch trees, which have got those little, I think it was silver birch with the little, little leaves that have a you know, it's like a little silver birch, you know, silver thing with lots of those little, little leaves. And, and, and while people were speaking, you know, giving the speeches, the, the, uh, the wind was running through. And it was very powerful because there was a lot of death mm. in the air. Mm. This place was being named, this new school. This, it was called the Isaac Paulos uh, school of Well-Being and Education. Edu yeah, Well-Being and Education. Mm -hmm. John Snow was there to open it, and I was there to read a poem, and these young children got up and read poems to Isaac Paulos. Mm -hmm. And I love listening to people's poems as a poet myself. And I... Well, would you like to, would you like to read a bit from My Name is From Why? My Name is Why? Because Wild? I yeah. think this will explain quite a lot about you and where we might go okay. in the next okay. 45 minutes. Can I just say, finish that little tale? It'll only take a second before I read this. <laughs> just, just, I just want to tell you this one thing, okay? Just one thing, all right? <laughs> <laughs> and it's that, it's that their poems, which were like, you know, Isaac Paulus, I didn't know him, but he made me want to be a better human being. And they all rhymed, and they were all... And I wondered whether some of those young people had met Isaac, but, but I was reading a poem that I'd read many times before, and I knew how to perform it to the audience. What I'm saying is that the value of their testimony to this young boy, as young children themselves, mm. was, uh, I want to say, inestimable but I want to say that it, was, it had great value in those words. I was going to get up and perform a poem that I knew how to perform, <coughs> you know, about love and about, you know, if, if ever there was one to whom when you are sleeping, who would wipe your tears when in dreams you were weeping, who would offer you time when others demand, whose love lay more infinite than grains of sand. If there was, see, I knew how to perform it because I know what the poem is, and I've done it a million times before, and every time I read it, it means something. But it was not as valuable as those words written for that moment at that time. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? That's, that's journalism, isn't it? It's, it's the, their wit, them, them as witnesses. Them as you know? witnesses, yeah. because the personal uh, becomes yeah. the universal, or yeah. the universal becomes a personal, yeah. it's a death. Yeah. And yeah. we've seen the death of... Yeah. Queen, and we were yes. talking about another death, yes. and it touches yes. us because yes. it makes us feel connected yes. in some ways. So this, uh, this is the preface um, of the book. Preface. Uh, at 14, I tattooed the initials of what I thought was my name into my hand. The tattoo is still there, but it wasn't my name. 
It's a reminder that I've been somewhere I should never have been. I was not who I thought I was. The authority knew it, but I didn't. The authority had been writing reports about me from the day I was born. My first footsteps were followed by the click, clack, clack of a typewriter. The boy is walking. My first words were recorded, click, clack, clack. The boy has learned to talk. Fingers were poised above a typewriter, waiting for whatever happened next. The boy is adapting. Paper zipped from typewriters and into files, and the files slipped into folders under the S section of a tall metal filing cabinet. For 18 years, this process repeated over and over again. Click, clack, clack. Secret meetings were held. The folders were taken out and placed on tables surrounded by men and women from the authority. Decisions were made. Put him here. Put him there. Shall we try drugs? Try this. Try that. After 18 years of experimentation, they threw me out. It locked the, it threw me out. It locked the door securely behind me and hid the files in a data company called the Iron Mountain. So I wrote to the authority and I hand delivered the letter and the reply informed me that I had to write to customer services. I, I was a customer now. So I wrote to customer services and customer services replied to say they were not permitted to release the files. The authority placed me with incapable foster parents. It imprisoned me. It moved me from institution to institution. And yet now at 18 years old, I had no history, no witnesses, no family. In 2015, following a 30 year campaign to get my records, the chief executive of Wigan Council, Donna Hall, wrote me a letter. She had them. Within a few months, I received four thick folders of documents marked A, B, C, and D. Click, clack, clack. On reading them, I knew. I took the authority to court. How does a government steal a child and then imprison him? How does it keep it a secret? This story is how. <laughs> you know, and it's, it, it, I've said before, but it is true, um, Gavin, that family is a set of, could be a set of disputed memories between one group of people over a lifetime, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And I did not have anybody to dispute the memory of me at 18 years of age. After 18 years of being on earth, I didn't know anybody who knew me for longer than a year when I left care. Mm. And I say knew me, meaning that I'd eaten in their house uh, more than two times, okay? So, yeah. so, so like after the foster parents, yeah. So. So finding witnesses to what my child happened in my childhood became imperative to me, and I I got my files in two thousand and fifteen. I took the government to court. Mm -hmm. That um, resolved. It took, that took three years. So halfway through two thousand eighteen, and this book came out in two thousand and nineteen, and it was on number one of the Sunday Times bestseller list for one week only. But it's all good. <laughs> You know, on, in August of 2019. <laughs> it was there. You, you, was you got the T-shirt. Philippa Perry pipped me uh. Uh, with that brilliant book about parents, um, things your parents shouldn't tell you or something like that. But um, So those files that I got are actually in this book. And you'll see there's, you know, I mean, I, did, I didn't know what, you know, basic facts like how much I weighed at birth. I'd never known. And that, that's a way of being able to show you what was taken away from me, you know. So it's, it's, it's that, it was, it was like pieces of my DNA had been, been hidden from me. Um, my, my memorative, my memory DNA. If, you know, if, I wonder if there is a kind of memory DNA. But, 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 but there it was, 
the birth weight and I was six pounds, no ounces. And, 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 she's, and there's a message here that's from a nurse that says, buttocks satisfactory. <laughs> what the hell is that? I'm, <laughs> and I thought, I thought... Now you knew. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but I, I thought that was a sort of like... Um, uh, What's that Sarah, ba Sarah Bartman sort of racism, you know, of like, like, you know, checking a black boy's buttocks, you know. But actually, it, it wasn't. That's something that nurses did in the, in the 60s to check, I think, with rickets or something yeah. like that. Uh, it was a very specific... Um, specific, but, but, specific. But and there's a picture of me. Look. But look. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would steal that baby. I would. It's so cute. Lots of other people knew this stuff because the authority, as you said... Ah, yeah, you, but, yeah but, but this is the thing about, but, you know... You, you must know. You must have seen this. This is. I mean, governments, institutions, uh, war. Um, nobody's responsible. Yeah. You see, it's not my fault. Yeah, you know. Is, you get the people, people in the system telling you how bad the system is. Ah, oh, it's them up there. Yeah. It's those over there. You know, the book doesn't stop with anyone, does it? Mm. And as a child, I was in that Kafkaesque kind of nightmare of going. Look, here's the deal. You go into your office tomorrow, or into work, or into even to home. No, don't, don't actually. And just name, name who's not pulling their weight, who's not really doing the job, <laughs> who who's gone dead behind the flipping eyes, <laughs> who's working with young people that you really don't think should be working with young people, or in the office doing whatever job. Who's waiting for their retirement? You go into the office tomorrow and say that and see what happens to you. So you're a child in the care system and you know that nobody knows what the hell they're doing with you in particular and name it and see what happens to you. You see, I knew, I knew that nobody knew what to do and that they would, I knew, the, I knew that, the, that a system that does not know how to care for a child will fall, an institution that doesn't know how to care for a child, will fall on the lowest common denominator, which is uh, discipline. If you do this, you're wrong. If you do that, you're wrong. If you do that, you're wrong. If you do that, you'll be punished. Not if you do that is good. It's like these are the rules. And if you break them, and by the way, in wider society, people think children in care are bad anyway, so they're expecting you to do wrong. And then you get people in the institutions who actually believe that children in care are somehow uh, def have a deficit of morals. So they were actually expecting the child to do wrong. So I was watching this while in care saying, wow, you are punishing me, setting up systems of punishment. You call this care, yet you can't hug me. How can this be care? If you also, not only can you not hug me, but you can't acknowledge that me not being hugged will have a detrimental effect on me in your care. So I knew this when I was in care, Gavin. So what you sense in that book is what I sensed when I was in care was like, they're gonna get me. And, um, and I, I stand up for me in this book with the evidence with, that they'd written. In other words, right. I, it was hiding in plain, plain sight. You read those files and you can see. And the thing is, is I had no family. So it's not like the system could say, well, it was, because this is what they do as well. Oh, well, his mother, you know, his mother, especially the mothers, the good on the mothers. Mm. You see, the good on his bad mother. You see, I mean, I mean nothing's going to come, come good of that. You see, nothing's going to come good of that. And that, that reflects us, by the way, you know, us in our society, you know, yeah. Our judgmental nature. It's not just it's not the social workers, it's not the nuns from the mother and baby homes. No, it's not them. No, it, these happened in our watch, you know. The one th one thing you didn't mention there, but you do mention in the book, is yeah. race. Yeah, race. Now, what you've said applied to every, more or less everybody. Yeah, it did. Where, yeah. Whatever their background. Yeah. But where did race come into that? Talking of race, I will be in Ireland tomorrow and I'll be meeting one of the ministers for children, having dinner with him, because these issues, which were always seen as on the edge of our society, are actually, they show us up, you know, they, they are at the heart of who we are, you know. Mm -hmm. If we can't look after our kids, 
kids in care, then what can we look after? And Ireland can you look historically at, had a oh, really yeah. awful... There's been a reckoning. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but there are no... Oh, yeah, yeah, no, there's a, there's a lot of good work, a lot of good work being done in Ireland in a similar way that there's a lot of great anti-Nazi work come from Germany. That's where the anti-Nazi, you know, anti-National anti mm -hmm. Front started, was Germany. So it's, it's and the Catholic Church, and uh, I'm not blaming the Catholic Church, essentially, actually, that's a, that's a, that's a, the, there are a lot of big institutions, the church, the children's services, etc., which have done a lot of great work, but also have done a lot of damaging work as well, unfortunately. Um, that's a long story. Uh, what were you, what was I mean, your question? Uh, uh, Race. Oh, race. Oh, God, race. <laughs> oh, my God. You forgot. Well, you, you forgot know, I you, mentioned yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, but the thing is, the thing <laughs> is about race is, is um, it's a lot more nuanced than we often, we, 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 give, our, we give ourselves permission to see um, uh, race. My mum came to this country in the mid-60s to study. I was just saying this to a friend today, actually, who was searching for his family in Scotland. In fact, he's found his mum in Scotland. Uh, he's, half, he's from Pakistan now, isn't he? He's, he's now searching for his father. He's my age, but... Uh, yeah, my mum came from Ethiopia, which had never been colonised, unlike England. <laughs> <laughs> so Ethiopians of the 1960s under the Emperor Haile Selassie, Ethiopians were very proud because they, because they were very, because they, they, you know, they didn't need passports to travel most parts of the world. Ethiopian Airlines was one of the best airlines in the world. Mm -hmm. Airlines were, were a village then, so you were all taught by particular about two or three different schools actually in the world, and I think they were from America, uh, and then they taught the airlines, and then the airline, you know, so you were part mm -hmm. of a family, a very small family. 1971, 19, late 60s was a heyday. It was the, it was the, um, it was the catch me if you can era of, of when flights were at the top. 74 happened, plane crashes, uh, 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 what, what do you call them? Um, hijackings, et cetera, yeah, et cetera. The, the, the party was over. Yeah. For, 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 for the highlight was 73, 67, 73. I say this because my father was a pilot mm -hmm. for Ethiopian Airlines, but, uh, my mum landed here, found herself pregnant by my father, who was a pilot, who'd been charged with looking after her. <laughs> Google my mum, you'll see what I mean. Uh, um, it's so, so strange to be able to say that to an audience, isn't it? Google my mum, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> but, it, but, it, but, but life is so interactive yeah, now, yeah, you know, it's yeah. so sort of, and you can of follow will. the story, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, they want to know. But when you see her, you're like, oh, okay. Um, she was just so... Um, stunning, and um, and uh, so he, her father asked his father, would he escort her when she came to England to study? And she came to study in uh, Newbold, Bracknell, mm -hmm. um, and actually, yeah, at a Seventh Day Adventist school who had a Seventh-day Adventist school in Ethiopia, um, <laughs> which was, <laughs> which was, um, yeah, which was visited by the Emperor Haile Selassie, etc. It was a very, you know, very well-to-do school. My mum was from a very well-to-do family and so was my father. I say that, it wouldn't matter to, it wouldn't have mattered to me if they weren't, but she landed here, could afford to be here, had no intention of staying here, just doing her education, just like some of your children might have gone to Australia to educate or to Europe or what have you. Not anymore. But uh, <laughs> that's another story, yeah. Chancellor. You're going to get in real trouble. Now. <laughs> well, it's a, yeah. Um, but, um, uh, and she landed in a pit of confusion about, and backward confusion about race a tribalism which was v venal, is that the word, venal, you know, yeah. which was, uh, and which led to, like, you know, the black shirts, essentially, in East London, and, um, uh, or like the black shirts, and um, Enoch Powell and this speech 
called The Rivers of Blood Speech, which was given in 1968, in 1968 yeah. um, by um, a man called Enoch Powell, which was saying that there will be rivers of blood um, due to immigration, which was mainly from the Caribbean mm -hmm. uh, then, but then there was the Irish as well, and there was actually the Scots coming down to the King's Cross, and, the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and there was uh, also the African communities coming from Nigeria. We have to remember that England had gone, all Britain had gone all over the world, digging up uh, uh, um, uh, holes and throwing bodies into them so that they could rule the land. And then teaching the children of those dead people that England was a great place to be. So where else would they go when invited? The Caribbeans, the Windrush generation, except for here, etc. But anyway, there was all kinds of broiling racial uh, dis-ease uh, in the country. And my mother arrived from a country that had never been colonised, that had no idea, that loved the Queen and the King, because they had like an emperor in Ethiopia who was actually a friend of the Queen's as well. Came over here loving the idea of England uh, and studying here. First time away from home, 21 years of age, could afford to come with the Ethiopian currency, which is, means that she was a lot richer than most, most English people, but didn't come with that kind of snobbery, um, but came, uh, went to the college, was looked after, as you are in colleges and universities, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're looked after. You come from the other side of the world. Any of you, from any university you go to in, in Britain, especially Manchester, <laughs> uh, you, but, but, but you'll notice, you'll see them, you'll see them in, in the university here from all over the world looking for, essentially for, for learning, but for safety. You know, I want to be safe when I'm learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I want to be, I want to be looked after. I want to be in a safe environment. The school finds out my mother's pregnant. My mother finds out my mother's pregnant. <coughs> my mother finds out my mother's pregnant. It's 1967, and uh, you know, in England, at that time, if you were pregnant and a woman and you were not, you didn't have a, a husband, you were, there was something wrong with you. I mean, society needed to deal with you. I mean, women who were pregnant, and I, all the proof is out there, were seen, and not with a husband in the 1960s, were seen as the equivalent of estrogen terrorists. <laughs> and they had to be housed and looked after away from other people in case, in case they exploded and estrogen just went <laughs> everywhere and everybody got pregnant and the church would fall apart. The church would fall apart and families would fall apart. You look in this book, you'll see the first page. The Institute of Moral Welfare were the people who looked after the mother and baby homes in Wigan, St. Margaret's House. I can't actually read it because I can't see all the glasses. <laughs> but you'll see that it should say Institute of Moral, Moral Welfare or something like that. Uh, uh, affiliated to the Liverpool Board of Moral Welfare. Sorry, the Liverpool, affiliated, affiliated to, the, affiliated to yeah. the Liverpool Board of Moral Welfare. Talk about thought, I please. I hereby certify that Lem Sissy is free from infectious disease. <laughs> <laughs> Thank so the, goodness yeah, for that yeah. one. <laughs> but, 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 you know, yeah, you but, know, yeah. it, but there, is a, there is a very similarity to some of the, some of the work that was being done in, I, I, you know, I look at institutionalism, and how writing down a note makes it seem okay and getting everything officiated. And, and that's why I just do not trust institutions. Um, I don't distrust them, but it's not my instinct to immediately trust them. Um, uh, so, so she was sent to a mother and baby home from the school, from that safe in the north of England in uh, Bolton. Cold. Which is miles away yeah, from yeah. where she... I think of that journey actually quite yeah. a lot. Of, and what she must have been thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she went to this mother and baby home. My mother's very religious. Ethiopia is very religious. It's in the Bible. Abyssinia is well, throughout the Bible. Uh, she was very religious. And um, they send her to the north of England where she's in a mother and baby home. She speaks English as her second language. She also speaks Italian and Amharic. And probably Tigrinya as well. 
Ethiopia is 50% Muslim, 50% Christian. And uh, she's held there. And this is the process of the mother and baby home. And I'll be talking about this in Ireland tomorrow. They know that I know about this. The process is the woman is at her most vulnerable. She's made to work for her keep, which means that she has to clean up in the mother and baby home. Okay, that she has to, you know, polish the, the, the front steps and, you know, clean the windows and, and do the sheets and the, like, she, so she's, she's paying for her keep. This is important. Um, because the, 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 the mother and baby homes are run by the nuns. They have systems. This goes back to Magdalene laundries as well, by the way, this work, work ethic. But while she's being asked to do those things, while she's sleeping in these dormitories, she's also being made to feel guilt for what she's done. All the women are in this place. You're, you're here because your parents don't want you in with them because you've done something bad. So we're mixing together this idea that they've done something wrong, that they should feel guilt and they should work their way through it. They've got something to work out of themselves. Now, the primary purpose is that that woman, at her most vulnerable, on the bridge between childhood and adulthood, signs the adoption papers. Now, the adoption papers aren't done by the nuns. They're done by a social worker who, in lieu with, these, with the nuns, priming these women, comes to the bedside, literally, to introduce the idea of the adoption. You're going to have questions about this, but those women, most of them, will have never heard the word adoption before. It's not been part of their lexicon. They're on the edge of childhood and adulthood. Right. It's not something that people talk about. It actually, it wasn't in the 60s. You know, you didn't say, yeah. oh, this one's adopted. Oh, I, I, did. I think, we, look, we, let's put the lights up and get some questions. Yeah, OK, later, all right. I know okay. you want to continue okay. with this, but I want to bring in. I'm Can sorry, we, I'm doing a bit of railroading, aren't uh, no, I? I'm that, sort of like, yeah, a, yeah, you so, know. Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> no, no, it's great. Yeah, it's, but can we put the lights up? And I'm sure there's people who'd like to ask questions. And I, I should also do a shout out, actually, because we've got people from uh, Amber Foundation, which is a youth charity in Ashford, and the Caldecott Foundation, which is a provider of therapeutic care and education for children and young people. And I'm sure there are many people who would like to ask questions. Can I just say one thing? I've got to ask this. I've got to say mm -hmm. this: is that my mother refused to sign the adoption papers from that social worker, so he gave me to foster parents and said, "Treat this as an adoption; is yours forever." will get her to sign the adoption paper. And by the way, all of this is proven. I've proven here. They've, they've, in here, they say the mother is trying to find him. We better not tell them. We better not tell him. And did, did you not know that till you got no. all the papers released? But I knew no, that, no, but I knew that things had been done that were wrong. Otherwise, right. why was I at 18 years of age left on my own with nobody? Right. You know, with the, after, after being imprisoned. In an, in an assessment centre, after 17 years of being in care, they deemed it necessary to imprison me, to assess me. There was something fundamentally wrong with how I was treated. Most children who are stealing from Tesco's, they're not kids in care, they're your kids. But when your kids steal from Tesco's, you don't call the police. You panic. And you make up a solution and you pray to God or to whoever you want to pray to that you might have the right answer because you are improvising. But when a child in care steals from Tesco's, breaks a window, the police are called. That is criminalisation. And the people around them on the housing estates will be the first to point at them as the bad kids. What I'm trying to say is that kids are good and bad all of the time. But when you're in care and you're, quote, bad, you are somehow a threat to society. Incredible that a traumatised child should be seen that way. In other words, if you're in care and you do smash a window, somebody should be there, there in the care system to say, that makes sense that you would do that. But the punishment regime that you are assessed by is so far from being the nature of care if anybody deserves to smash a window, it's a child in care. Yeah. And, and why have we had this attitude towards them? It's come from, I'm afraid, why the social services was built. As you go back into the history of the social services, if you go back to Dickens and you look at how institutions 
have been set up, how charity is something that we do from a distance. It's fa absolutely fascinating. And obviously, this is my hobby horse. <laughs> you know, obviously, I've, I've, I've dug yeah. into the research just like I did with that poem. And I've not been wrong. But this is the thing that I wanted to say. Adoption is the greatest thing that one human being can do for another. I tell you it is. I tell you it is. Because any mother or father will know that whatever your weak spot is, your child is going to press that button. So if your weak spot is money, your child is going to say, give me money. All the time I want money. And if your weak spot is your mother, your child is always going to go, grandma is the best thing I've ever known. You are horrible. <laughs> grandma gives me money. OK? So a child is going to get you at your weak, whatever your weakest spot. Therefore, to adopt is the greatest thing as human beings can do. And there are people who are adopted who come to sit up to me and say, well, my adopted mother, I never got on with her. She never got on with me. And it must be because I'm adopted. Well, let me show, tell you, I can show you a million people who've got mothers and fathers who feel exactly <laughs> the same way about them. <laughs> <laughs> right, fuck this. <laughs> So many, so many, I know, I know. So I'm pressing all kinds of buttons here, aren't I? Yeah. We, yeah. we had your, one of your poems you read out, just the, one, the, the Grenfell poem. Yeah, um, yeah. My daughter's here. We had it read at her wedding. So oh, it's amazing. So happy. That poem, it goes into some oh my gosh. different, you know, a Grenfell poem, it, a wedding poem. It, it, but it, it, that was just an aside. It's a beautiful thing. But I've got to say, thank you for reading that at that, that time, because it means so much to me, that poem. And every time somebody says that they, you know, were married to, to, to that poem, it's a beautiful thing. And thank you. I feel quite emotional because that's what a poem should do, you know. It's special. Uh, but no, I've got, you've said so many things. Um, and your indignation that came out when you were in the children's home, and you implied, I think, that by taking them on, yes. you ended up, I suppose, being picked on by the system. And whether that was the case and whether you had to repress that in order to oh, it, stay safe. Oh, no, no. Safe. Read the book, and honestly. Whether, therefore, <laughs> you were waiting for the moment later on. I don't know whether when you took the government on, whether you won it. I mean, that's maybe... I settled out, settled out of court. Okay, so, so, okay. So. I was like, oh, yeah, oh, no, I love that. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to repress, that's my question. Did you have to repress that... Uh, anger and oh no 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 justice. no no! no I've, thank you. No, I've been I've been angry. You know, I mean, I could just as well have been a different story. You know, um, I don't think that um, I don't know how. You know, I, I, for me personally, I was saved by finding the thing that I loved to do, which was write, and um, that, that 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 is what saved me. I think for another young person, it could be the fact that you know, like I say, it's, it's not poetry isn't the answer. But what is the answer is finding something that you love doing. And that, that is it, the answer. And so it could be mending cars. I mean, there were lots of kids in care, I remember, that were great on, with cars. We, they, they stole them as well. <laughs> but they were great. They were, they, were, they were great with them. But um, so, no, 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 I've been angry. You know, been very angry. You know, what got me through, it, it, I don't know if you're leading to that, but what... You're not, you're not, okay. Well, no, well, I was wondering where you took that anger, but if you could not... Explain. Well, I, I used it in my writing, but it, like I say, if you find something that you love, you can put it into it, whether it's drumming or swimming or... But where did you take it at that age, at the home? Oh, age? yeah, no, well, well, well what, what are you going to do? You're a teenager, you're angry, you can't fully articulate it. I, it, you know, you'll see in the book, you, you don't have to buy it, I'll tell you. I, 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 um, I, uh... I, I got depression, man. I mean, I got it really badly. Like, in one of the children's homes, they, it was such a male, very male kind of wig and, like, these men had been hurt, you know. A lot of them who were working in the care system, they'd been hurt, you know. The whole area, the men had been hurt. Masculinity was, was being challenged, uh, rightly so, you know. But, but there was a lot of hurt men, there, and we were the young boys, you see. And it was all about... Um, it was all about uh, short, sharp shocks, you see. Um, no, I was, I was angry, but I, I, at, at a certain age, when I really saw how, how dangerous the situation I was in, everything shut down. Like, 
like psychologically, like everything shut down. And suddenly and strangely, I couldn't get out of the children's home. I couldn't walk down the street because I was aware of the people from the buses spitting at me, the, the people calling the police if I hanged around so much. The, all these things happened. But it, it suddenly took on a, a more surreal reality inside me where I felt like I couldn't actually, I couldn't get outside. I, I actually kept going to the front door and I couldn't get outside. But what was worse was that the people inside the home were not taking it seriously. So I was so, so frightened. Um, I needed to be diagnosed because if I wasn't diagnosed, they would do stuff to me. So I called my social worker and I got him to get me to a psychiatrist because I was frightened. And it's all in the book and it shows, and it even shows you in the book the the, 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 they, they then put me into an assessment center. It even shows the workers going, come on. But the person who stuck up for me and said, it makes sense that he would be like this, is the psychiatrist. Is the psychiatrist and who diagnoses me. Incredible. It, it's, all, it's all in there. Let's, let's move on. I'll take another couple of questions. There's a gentleman down there. Any ladies who'd like to ask a question? Hello, Havisha. Uh, there's a lady. Sorry, well, who? who? There's, two, there's two people there. There's two people. A woman there. Yeah. <laughs> I'd really like to hear from these amazing guys here. Uh, you had a question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Explain who you are. Well, um, my name's Nathan. Hi, Nathan. <laughs> Basically, yeah, it's just because uh, you have a very interesting story. Yeah. Um, and it's just, I feel like you are right. It's very wrong that why should the kid in care have got the blame for everything because they think they're a bad person. But at the end of the day, they have a future, right? Yeah. And... Yeah. Yeah, your story is a lot. Um, yeah. I'm sorry, I have to. No, it's okay. Thank you. That's okay. I don't, yeah, I don't really have a lot of questions. Yeah, no, no, well, you didn't ask one. The woman behind you gave it you. But, <laughs> but, um, but, but thank you for saying, but, 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 but thank you for suggesting that he speak, and thank you for, for speaking as well. I tend not to like hearing from young people personally. I like speaking for them and speaking <laughs> and speaking at you. You know what I mean? But I don't actually like you. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. Is there any young or old person, male or female or eh, yes, binary, yes. who would like to ask a question? I don't mind as long as I can see you. If you there guys, you do, if you folks there, if you do think of a question, just put your hand up and I will come straight to you. Seriously. Yes, go ahead. Hey, and thank you. Thank you. Particularly the books about psychiatrists. I'm a psychiatrist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. <laughs> you want a round of applause now or something? <laughs> I'd like to um, explore the idea of labeling. Labeling. Yes, because a lot of what you happened to you, your story, everyone's story, is about labelling. There is, this is a society that's obsessed with labelling. Yeah. And it immediately creates me and the other. So whether it's, I don't know, veganism, feminism, it's me and the other. And it starts to put categories. And I don't think we've changed. I think we've just moved to different labels. Can I? Yeah. Because, like, I... You know, when I was younger, you say, oh, what are you? You know, you're from round here. Because oh, I thought my name was Norman for the first 15 years of my life. And then I saw my birth certificate and it said Lem Sisse on it. Mm. Follow the paper trail, you know. Mm -hmm. That's it. Follow the paper trail. Um, uh, so people be like, oh, you're from Wigan. Where are you from? Blah, blah, blah. It's like, I'm, I, I, get, I, get, I get every, I, get, I am a black man, 100%. I am a human being. I am a northerner. I am a collection of molecules. I'm a Wiganer. Uh, I'm uh, metropolitan. I live in, in, in London. I'm, I'm African. I'm British. I'm, uh, I'm an egg, uh, an overdeveloped egg. 
Uh, I am. I never see what I am because I'm looking from the outside in. So, like, we often do need um, labels to understand what's in the bottle. Um, but like, I've got tons of them. You can just keep making them up. <laughs> you can just make them up. <laughs> I'm a freaking dandelion. <laughs> <laughs> see what I mean? It's like the, our, our institutions would often like us to use the terminology that it wants us to use to describe ourselves. That's a different matter. But actually, I can have as many labels I want, and I can paint them in any color I want and put little designs on them. And you can, you can call me black if you want to. You can call me a human being. You can call me, you know, whatever you want to. It's fine. Call me by your name. Call me by <laughs> my name. That sounds like a good idea. Now, time for a couple more questions. Yes. Hello. Oh, go. Yeah, yeah, go. Um, I'm going to start by firstly saying that I was also in hospital care. Okay. And I completely agree with your experience. And I had a very, very similar experience of the pure injustice of the care system. Um, but my question is yeah. to you. Yeah. Whilst we're fighting the bigger war, because I'm also um, training to be a social worker. I'm doing my degree in social work now. OK. And whilst that doesn't mean to say you have to be a social worker. No, but whilst we're fighting the bigger war yeah. of changing policies and legislation and law, yeah. in your opinion, Good. what can social workers do every day to make a difference to the care system? Every day, to make a difference to the care system? Wow, beautiful. Uh, what can social workers do every day to, uh, uh, to, um, to help change the system? Something like that? What I would like most of all for social workers to do is to be able to, um, to, be able to sustain and feed their own well-being. Okay, I want healthy minded, spiritually healthy people looking after young people in care. I don't want people who are constantly telling me that they're burned out. One of the worst things that happened to me when I, you wasn't expecting that answer, were you? <laughs> no, you know what I mean? I want, I want, I want, I want and, and they, you know, I, social workers deserve the best because they are living on the front line. When families are all defining themselves in a sort of like a, you know, the families are always very quick to say how good they are. Oh, don't say anything bad. Don't say anything bad about my, my mum. Don't say anything bad about my dad. That's fighting talk. It happens from school. You know, it happens from school. Do you say anything bad about my It's not like fighting talk. And so we're protecting something, which we then go on to protect as we get married and we have kids and we do this. I've got a house. I've got a home. Everything's fine. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but the, the point is, is that uh, dysfunction is at the heart of all function in families, I believe. And we are protecting something which is beautifully dysfunct dysfunctional. Why, uh, sorry, I'm going all the way around the houses here. Um, what I'm trying to say is that social workers are the ones who say it stops now. Or most of social workers' work is keeping families together. It's not separating families. It's keeping them together. But families don't like to admit that they haven't got the tools to fix themselves. No, they don't want to admit that. They'll, do all, they'll hide all kinds of abuses before admitting that something is wrong. And by the way, that's most families where the children are not in care. So I know that social workers have empathy are right at the root of themselves. And I want them to be able to look after and to build on whatever it was that made that empathy in the beginning. Being in social worker is not taking away from that. I want being in social work to be able to enhance that empathy. You see? And, and those instinctive skills, not take them away, but give to them, add to them, so that the person doesn't feel calloused after a life in social work. Feels appreciated. I think social workers should be the highest paid of, 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 of people who are working in, in local government, the highest paid, because they're looking after the most important asset of local government, and that's children in need, and families in need. It's too easy to do that, I hate social workers thing, that binary thing. You see, that's what society wants us to do. It wants us to go them and us, and it's not. It's us and us. Difficult to know when you're actually in the care system and you, you're angry. You couldn't have said that to me when I was in care. I was so angry, but I actually I loved my social worker, my last one, and he's the hero of this book. He's a hero, and he's, coincidentally, his name is Norman. 
true. It's true. <laughs> and by the way, the reason I thought my name was Norman for the first 15 years of my life is because the social worker who stole me from my mother gave me to foster parents and said, treat this as an adoption is, is yours forever. He said one thing to them, just one thing. You must call him Norman. So my foster parents wanted to call me Mark after Mark in the Bible because they didn't want to foster me. God had told them to foster me. Big problem that, because at 12, when I had adolescence, they were like, the devil is inside of him. <laughs> so the point is, is that the first lie, that first lie, that call him Norman, was evidence that something was wrong. That when I left care, they had to give me an administrative piece of paper because they were an administrative institution. And that piece of paper was my birth certificate. And my birth certificate said on it, Lem Sisse. And when I saw that, I thought, I have written proof that something wrong has happened. And the last page in those files that I got from the social services that I spoke about in the preface at the beginning of this whole thing, the last page of those files is my letter writing them, asking them for my files when I was 18 when I left the care system. And the reason that I did that is because the Children's Legal Centre in London, who set up a group called Who Cares, the Children's Legal Centre in London was following the Freedom of Information Act, which was set up by David of the SDP, the David Scottish, oh, yeah. Scottish, David, Steel. David Steele, and that, that, that Liberal Democrats, that, 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 that Freedom of Information Act, 1984-85, uh, it was a particular move in government, meant that local government had to show the files that were written for people. And the Children's Legal Centre, through the Who Cares pressure group, told me that, which gave me access to those files, which is why I wrote that letter. And they hadn't even had a model for showing the files, um, but they had a... a it's, 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 it, it, it's in there, but it's... Um, it shows one thing, that if you're in care, unity with other care leavers and pressure groups are incredibly important. Children's, children's in care groups are important, not to take the government to court, but to find, to compare notes. Them. Sorry, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. I am too. Uh, sorry, we've, <laughs> we've, we've got to stop, haven't we're we? We're supposed to stop. I, I think we've got, I tell you what, we, we've just we've got, got, a, got a minute question? or two left. Just, Another question? Just, just one more <gasps> question. Go on. Who, who, who would like Oh, there's a woman there, actually. Okay. She has had her hand up for quite a while. Yeah, let's by, do the way, one more. by the way, this has got to be a good question, okay? Yeah. This, this gotta gotta be. Be, everybody, else, everybody else has got to be thinking, my word, I wish I'd have asked the question that that person was going to ask to Lem, because I had, there are people here who had questions that they wanted to ask me, which, 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 were life, which would have been life-changing for them, life-changing. But they're all thinking, no, no, I don't need to ask my question because this question is the one that I wanted to hear and I didn't even know it myself. Go on then. <laughs> my question is, obviously you have an amazingly intricate and really touching story. Yeah. Would you change anything about your story, um, or would you leave it all over the same? Great question. Great question. Great question. Boom. That's a beautiful question. Thank you. Um, I would say to you that I would, I've always said in my life um, that I would give it all up for a family. Um, for somebody that would call me on my birthday that knew me when I was a child. I've, I've said that most of my life. I'm 55 years of age. I know, I know. 55 <laughs> years of age. And, and um, I'm happier than I've ever been in life. Um, uh, and, and I don't believe that's the case now. I no longer think that I would give it up, because it's, it's a good line. I no longer think that I would give it up uh, for a family. Um, I forgave my foster parents and I forgave the social workers fully, eye to eye. Um, the story remains the same, but the forgiveness has allowed me to be able to not just live with who I am, but um, try to learn to believe in who I am. It's a great question. Great question. And if I may say so, 
Not a bad answer either. <laughs> Lem Sisse, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.